Chairman Moran, Chairman Takano, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of AMVETS. This time last year, AMVETS rang the alarm. We suggested that the VA's mental health system was fundamentally broken. Simply providing additional resources would not fix what is still horribly broken. Over Memorial Day weekend, AMVETS will hold the world's largest one-day motorcycle event in Washington, D.C. called Rolling to Remember. We expect hundreds of thousands of Americans to stand united to raise awareness that there are still more than 80,000 American military men and women missing in action and jumpstart a national conversation around the veteran suicide epidemic. I pointed to that flag high up there on the mantle Right next to the picture of my grandpa in those medals They gave to him when he came back Fighting that war overseas He said, come on over here now Let me tell you a story About those who fought with honor With this flag we call all glory I can see the pride in his eyes as he said these words to me That flag stands for freedom Pure faith and hope One nation, another God Another soldier coming home Heaven's full of heroes Cause freedom don't come free He laid his dog tag in my hand In that moment I began to understand Our flag is full of falling Flag is all falling. He said, Every time I hear those sirens screaming through the night, there's another angel on the way to save another life. I close my eyes, say a prayer, and pledge allegiance to those stars and stripes. That flag stands for freedom, courage, faith, and hope. One nation, another God, another soldier coming home. Now heaven's full of heroes, the freedom don't come free. There's those who run out and who run in. In that cross on the hill, we understand our flag is all the fall. For the past 32 years, patriotic motorcyclists from every walk of life, from every corner of this nation, have come together in Washington, D.C. over Memorial Day weekend for a mass pro-veterans demonstration. Unfortunately, this year, as everyone knows at this point, we cannot come together physically, but I thank you for coming together with us virtually for this demonstration to continue helping raise awareness throughout the United States and to allow our lawmakers to understand that we still care very much. 
Um, after this video, which I think you're going to enjoy and I hope you find very informative over the next couple of hours. I know that sounds like a long time, but I don't think it's a long time to give to learn uh, about what's happening out there in our veterans population and for our active duty military, for the families of the fallen. And those are who we're fighting for and those are who we need you to fight for. And after you watch this video today, we ask that you please sign the petition that's on RollingToRemember.com. We ask you to get out on your bike if you're able to on Sunday, ride your own 22 miles where you can safely in your community using the Rever app to track it. Uh, it's not tracking your personal information, uh, but it'll be letting us know how many people are actually out there riding, how many miles have been ridden. And we're gonna take the petition and we're gonna take how many miles were been ridden. We're gonna bring those to Capitol Hill. We're gonna give those to Congress. We're gonna give those to the White House. Um, we've spoken with the president as you'll see later in this video. Uh, we'll be talking uh, with the White House again after this to show them just how many Americans still care about these issues and still demand that our federal government keeps its promises to our veterans, our military, and the families of the fallen. Hello. It's my privilege to be a small part of the 2020 Rolling to Remember National Motorcycle Ride. While circumstances have changed our format this year, the focus remains the same. You ride as an advocate for those over 80,000 POWs and MIAs, as well as 22 veterans a day who end their lives due to hopelessness and loneliness and the internal turmoil that they suffer. You ride to support the families who are left to grieve and to wait and to wonder about their loved ones. You ride to heighten awareness of the untold personal sacrifices and the epidemic of veteran suicide. Our nation's history is replete with times when Americans have come together to change our history for the better. So riders, mount up like the old patriot Paul Revere. Spread the word across the land that America's prisoners of war, missing in action, and those contemplating suicide will not be forgotten. There may not be a million bikes this year in the parking lot at the Pentagon, but there will be a million riders on the concrete highways and dusty back roads of this nation so that those we honor today will never be forgotten. So ride your 22 mile challenge, donate your $22, do your 22 pushups to demonstrate that you, that we know the sacrifice that it takes to live in a free nation. A verse from the 28th Psalm says this, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My trust will always be in him. I wish you Godspeed on your ride. I ask you to be vigilant, to be smart, and to be safe out there. And may God bless all of you in your endeavors. Thank you. Hello, America. My name is Dave Bray, USA. At this time, I'd like to ask you to rise up out of your seats. Firmly place your hand over your heart. And as we sing our nation's song, I'd like to ask you to remember that our flag and our freedom have been paid for by the blood of our brave sons and daughters. So let's take this moment to respect them and to respect this flag as we sing our song. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet
appreciate that you're here, and uh, we're here for you. And I told you, when you want to come back with your 600,000, we're ready to take you. Rolling to remember, and that's what it is, rolling to remember, and we will be commemorating Memorial Day. It's a big thing. Together, our nation pays a mortal tribute to the extraordinary courage, unflinching loyalty, and unselfish love and supreme devotion of the American heroes who made the ultimate sacrifice, and that's what you're here for. They laid down their lives to ensure the survival of American freedom. Their names are etched forever into the hearts of our people and the memory of our nation. And some of you, it's been very close, very, very close. It's very close to your heart. We'll cherish them and our Gold Star families for all time. We take good care of them. They're very special to us. Just as we'll always remember the nearly 82,000 Americans missing in action. And thank you for keeping this noble tradition alive and for preserving the memory of those who are missing, but never forgot, never forgot. Welcome everyone to the AMVETS Rolling to Remember Virtual Ride. My name is Sherman Gillums. I'm the Chief Advocacy Officer for AMVETS National. What you're about to see are a group of interviews from some great Americans. Some of them are veterans. Some of them are active duty service members. A few of them are families who have lost loved ones, either in battle or to suicide. All of these interviews tell a story of inspiration, of adapting and overcoming adversity, and why we must remember Memorial Day as more than just a time to get together with family and barbecue. It's also a time for us to remember those who made the great sacrifice for our country to be free. As I sit here at the gates of the hollow grounds of Arlington National Cemetery, I can't help but to think about what Memorial Day means, not just today, when we'll hear from stories of both inspiration and loss, but every day as these men and women who occupy these grave sites and the families that visit them throughout the year must now be remembered, not just today, as we will to remember them, but every day. My name is Army or U.S. Army Master Sergeant Cedric King. Um, I served for 20 years uh, in the United States Army. And now I give back to a number of different nonprofits that are doing right by veterans. I think overcoming some of the things that I've had to overcome, one of the things was uh, I, I'm sitting here with, uh, <laughs> with these prosthetic legs here. I just got finished with my bike ride, but these are my prosthetic legs that I, that I have and I've had every day now for almost the last eight years. Uh, I lost both my legs in Afghanistan uh, while on a foot patrol. I was a platoon sergeant at the time, and we were in a very proud part of Kandahar. And if you know anything about uh, Afghanistan, Kandahar is one of the nastiest spots you can go to. It's not the nastiest, probably, but if you if you get sent somewhere, you know Kandahar, you're gonna have to do your share of fighting. If you are in a place right now where you are are being met with struggle, you're really having to see who you are. And being put in Kandahar eight years ago. I got the chance to find out if I really am brave. If I really, if I, if I really can lead men when it's not easy to lead men, can I really silence the critic on the inside? Can I really do all of that stuff when it's not easy to do? It's it, it may not be easy to do it in a boardroom or an office, but if you can do it on a battlefield, you can do it those other three places. You can. And I was very fortunate to have done that. Very fortunate to have served not just to serve my country, but man, to find out a lot about myself. The man who knows about himself, he can defeat a lot of enemies, especially the one on the inside. So when I lost my legs, I had a little bit more of a broad perspective to look at life, not as a punch in the gut, but as a gut check almost, you know? Here's a gut check. Yeah, it might hurt. Yeah, it might suck. But, but, you could do it because you did it before you did it on in ranger school. You did it uh, when you were on missions in Afghanistan before you did it when you were in Iraq, you had led men. I had lost and I had won and I had lost and I had won. 
I had fallen and picked myself back up again. So when this happened, I had a point of reference. It's so difficult for young men and women that are met with this particular adversity. They just don't have points of reference to, to, to reach back on. So when this happens, yeah, it is easier to fall apart. Not because the injury is worse, but you just don't have any place to go to that you won before. When people, when people struggle with meaning, when people struggle to the point where they feel like that they have to hurt themselves, it always it, it's so tough, man, to hear. I've had really good buddies, man, even before, even before the war. And now, because of the war, they feel like that they got to go in the garage, cut on the car, roll down the windows, and check out. Look, I'm going to tell you, man. That's probably the thing that makes me the most... And like it's hard to make me mad, man. But golly, I'm not necessarily mad at the person that does this, although I although I am a little bit, although I am a little bit because that ain't what the military taught us, man. This Ranger tab right here never did a block of instruction on how to just let the moment overtake you and you tap out. I don't know that lesson. I don't know that. I do know that times can get tough where you feel like it ain't no reason I should be here anymore. Look, 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 man, look. Hey, I know. I got two stumps right here. Plenty of times I've been frustrated. And it ain't nothing I could do about getting my legs back. It ain't nothing you can do about making your friends come back. It, it, the survivor's guilt. There's nothing you can do to bring them back. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this. You talk to any one of those buddies that you lost, the last thing that they're going to tell you is check out because I'm not here no more. When, when Memorial Day, Veterans Day, 4th of July, these very patriotic days come about, these very heavy uh, military-friendly holidays come about, it's not a party for some people. It's a way to remember someone that they love that they've lost. And I will tell you this, the thing that, is, that helps us out and helps so many of my other brethren out uh, that have lost family members is this, is taking that opportunity to be a blessing to someone else. And maybe it's not a, it's not a go out and find another gold star uh, parent, although that would be great too, but it's, it's taking the opportunity where you had a loss and making someone else have a gain. Taking, taking the moment where you need the pats on the back and you need the hug and put your arms around someone else. And in that, in that specific day, at that specific time, find a way to give when what you had was taken. Family members go through the war, the combat, the struggle, just like the service member. And sometimes even more than the service member because not, no, they don't have the amputations and no, they don't have the, the bullet wounds and no, they don't have the memories, but they, they have to be able to be there while you're hurting until you're healed. And sometimes that's tough. They have to be there through all the bad times. They have to be there through all the bad nightmares. They have to be there through all the, the frustrations. They have to remember how, how tough you were and how vulnerable you are now and still love you. The family members are the true heroes. Our vision in the National Cemetery Administration is to ensure that no veteran ever dies. They only die truly when people stop saying their name and telling their story. It is so amazing and humbling to me that we have Americans who do what we should do on a day like today, Patriot Day, 9-11, and that is remember. Memorialization goes further than a headstone. 
It goes further than providing a place with the person's name and where they're buried. The Veterans Legacy Memorial is an ideal way to tell the story, to let people know about those who served our country. And we do it in such a format that anyone, anywhere, can access that information online or even in the cemeteries where our heroes rest. That's why it's so unique. It is an important part of meeting our sacred duty to honor and remember those who gave us everything we've got. We write no last chapters. We close no books. We put away no final memories. An end to America's involvement in Vietnam cannot come before we have achieved the fullest possible accounting of those missing in action. Why keep searching? The answer is simple. You never leave a fallen American behind. The mission of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency, or DPAA, is to provide the fullest possible accounting for our missing personnel to their families and their nation. Strategically located in Arlington, Virginia, with major facilities at Joint Base Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hawaii, in Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska, the more than 600-person newly established defense agency is jointly manned by soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, and Department of Defense civilians with specialized skills. Researching, recovering, identifying, and ultimately returning an individual to their family begins with analysis and investigation. The DPAA experts begin the search by studying all known information regarding the circumstances of each loss. Historians and analysts gather information from U.S. veterans, foreign witnesses, archival records, and other sources. They then create a case file for each unaccounted for American. This file may include historical records, official correspondence, maps, photographs, daily activity logs, and medical and personnel records of the missing person. These files are continually updated until an identification is made. Once the research has been done here uh, and we get the command's approval, we'll, we send out small teams. It could be up two people. It could be a 10-person team uh, conducting interviews at a, at a villager's house, at a district office, or in a combination of, their, of going to the site first and, and then conducting the interviews on site. Once all available information is analyzed, a decision can be made to disinter individuals buried as unknown or conduct field investigations. During a typical investigation mission, personnel interview potential witnesses, conduct on-site reconnaissance, and survey terrain for safety and logistical concerns. Teams also try to generate new leads that may result in future recoveries. The main goal of the investigation is to obtain enough information to correlate or connect a particular site with one or more missing Americans. If enough on-site evidence is found, the site will be recommended for recovery and excavation. Recovery sites range in size from a few square meters, such as in individual burials, to areas larger than football fields for aircraft crashes. DPAA may hire as many as 100 local workers to help with the excavation process. This job has so many benefits. For me personally, it's an opportunity to serve the country, but also our fighting forces and kind of contribute to that as well. Professionally, it's just an incredible challenge to get to work in all the countries where we work, to travel to these amazing sites, uh, to work with the local villagers and local officials, uh, and just have the opportunity to give somebody some answers after decades of waiting to know what happened to their loved one and you know maybe just wrestling with the grief that that lack of information and lack of answers brings, we have the chance to resolve that for them. And, and that's just an incredible opportunity. 
Investigative and recovery missions in search of missing Americans take DPAA personnel to distant, remote, and often dangerous locations all over the globe. Rice paddies in Southeast Asia, areas on the Korean Peninsula, 16,000 foot mountaintops in the Himalayas, and underwater sites off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And we still continue to search the battlefields of World War II throughout Europe. After a successful recovery, all evidence is then transported to the DPAA laboratories. Once they've arrived in the lab, the painstaking process of identification begins. This is the final step of the mission, leading to the return of an individual. In many of the cases, an important step in the identification process is DNA analysis, which is accomplished by cutting a bone sample that is sent to the Armed Forces DNA Identification Laboratory. One of the challenges DPAA faces today is the lack of reference samples from family members of those still unaccounted for. Any person who is a relative of an unaccounted for American is encouraged to contact their service casualty office to ensure there is a DNA reference sample on file for that service member. DPAA makes an identification when all available evidence remains. Artifacts and historical documents point to the same person. The ID process can take anywhere from a few months to several years to complete. Any unresolved cases are kept open with the hope that new evidence will be found or new technologies will be developed to make a future identification possible. Once an American has been identified, there remains a return to their family through their respective service casualty office. They are returned home with full military honors and given the respect they earned through their service and sacrifice for their country. Oh, as a family member, this agency to me is doing phenomenal work and in a very personal way because when Somebody loses somebody, like my father, and you really don't know what the story is for 70 years. And then you find an agency that knows about him and keeps his, his memory alive, keeps the mission alive to try to find him. It's very meaningful in a very personal way because it means you're not just doing this yourself alone. You have a whole body of people who are concerned about finding your dad and bringing him home. That says something about how we honor our dead, particularly those who have served this nation. Well, I'm very grateful to all of the DPAA and the related agencies, and the military in general, as they've pursued this in our government and for our citizens because they think it's an important enough mission to continue. And the way we value life in very few nations, very few nations, I don't think any other nation to this degree does this. Which, you know, makes me proud to be an American. I just wanted to yell to openly to everybody out there, he's home, he's home. I couldn't believe it. And when I went up and touched his name, I thought, you're home, you're home. It's unbelievable. I'm glad I live in the United States of America and that we have this attitude. Leave no man behind. We are, we're so fortunate. I want you to know, and I know from my own experience that if something's happened to you, we will be looking for you. The men and women of the Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency are united in their effort to recover and return as many of our missing personnel as possible. One more patriot return, one more family that now has answers. One more step in fulfilling our nation's promise.
Well, we hope you found that video informative and we appreciate Kevin Costner's assistance in narrating that video. Um, it's such an important agency, DAPA, and what they do uh, is helping so many families as was shown so well there. Uh, unfortunately, what's not commonly known is that DAPA's operations have been paused worldwide in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. We believe it's time for them to start operations again, uh, especially in their labs where they can maintain their social distancing and whatnot. Um, we also feel very strongly that Congress needs to continue to fund DAPA uh, as Congress starts figuring out how they're going to pay for the COVID-19 relief packages. We do not want uh, them to even consider cutting uh, DAPA's funding. It's very important and time is of the essence right now with erosion and commercial development and, you know, it's honestly, um, you know, the decay, future you know, continuing decay of remains, things like that. Um, very important that they continue getting their work done now. My name is Portia Williams. I'm a United States Navy veteran. I served as an aviation boat mate fuels, and I volunteered for everything that I could while I was in the Navy. That's one of my favorite memories of being in the military, being able to volunteer for everything. So I was a part of the import emergency team. I was on a firefighting team. I, anytime they asked for a volunteer to do anything in the community or with the children or the schools, I was the first one to go. Um, and that's just really where I think I fine-tuned my my the core values i connected with the honor the courage and the commitment um the courage really really tough I've, I've always had the 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 willingness um and i was always ready to help in any situation anytime anything happened um but when i went into the military it gave me that chance to be able to be a part of something bigger than me and so i could say that's one thing that i can appreciate as the younger generation veteran um I can say that the POW, it did not, I don't know any. And with that being said, there was a specific portion of my service while we were deployed in which we had to go upstairs to like the high boss's office and we had to submit information, secret, uh, secret questions and answers just in case we were captured different locations of tattoos so that they could be able to identify us. And I think that that's when it hit home for me that thing, I could really die out here um, or I could really never come back home. They could really have to ask me these questions. Um, and it was scary. It was scary. Um, yeah, that was like a really defining moment for me. Um, I mean, I knew that I was in the military, but I think, don't you know, you have that moment when everything gets real. It wasn't when we left for deployment. It's when they start collecting that information. Thankfully, I came back home and every, almost everyone on our ship came back home. We had a few suicides on board. When I was in, I was operating, I was in uh, during Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom. Actually, when I was out, we were out when Osama bin Laden was killed. And so, um, they were negotiating well we were we were in the middle of a piracy operation as well and so we had uh four pirates uh, i mean 16 about 16 pirates kidnap um four americans hijacked their ship and kidnapped them and ended up killing them we were in negotiation with them for a few weeks but we had the cia on board the seals um, we had everybody on board trying to get these americans back safely and then maybe like a week or so after that went completely south. Um, they were saying that they were gonna to continue to keep us in what's called River City One. So River City One is when they cut off all communications. So nobody can call in or out except for the captain. Nobody can get on the internet. Nobody can send a letter. Nobody can do nothing. We go completely dark. Um, we're like in essentially in, in stealth mode. And so um, he had us in River City One and they said, okay, well, they're getting ready to go in um, and and kill Osama bin Laden. And we were privy to that information before they did it, which is why they cut all of our communications. They were initially going to dump his body, do a burial at sea off of our ship. However, they ended up doing it off of a West Coast ship that was out there with us at the time. Um, but 
the thought process of being in the middle of all of that water and being this tiny ship, even though I'm on an aircraft carrier, which is like three football fields long. I had that thought all the time. What if, you know, what if our J what if our jets can't get off fast enough? I watch Pearl Harbor and, and I see, um, the things that they that they went through, and that was always a question in our minds. But I just I, I couldn't imagine um, living through it. But I know that if I had to, I'd do my best, you know, just like we all would in those in those given um, in those given situations. We were prepared. We were well trained. And when it came down time to when we had a, we had a mass casualty on board, and when we had that mass casualty all of the jokes and the playtime and even the disagreements, even if you didn't like somebody, all of that stuff went out the window. And I think that was one of my, my hardest missions, but one of the most defining ones, because it showed me that despite anything, this team, this team of people, which I'm connected to forever, those are my brothers and sisters forever. We came together to, 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 to get it done, to complete the mission. The camaraderie that I have at the VA, oh, it's nothing like it. I I can't, I, I'm not going to say that it's the exact same as when, no, actually, you know, I can't even say that it's not the exact same as the people that I share that trauma with on the ship that day, because veterans, we are a unique bunch. And a lot of us have been deployed. So even if they weren't on my ship, because of them, we could. Because of y'all, we could. You know what I mean? So with that being said, I love veterans. Like, and 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 I have such a special bond, especially with the Washington DC VA Medical Center. But when I hear veterans, I feel family. I feel love in my heart. As you were speaking, I felt warmness and tingling within my heart. I miss my veterans so much. Um, when I went to the VA, I was completely broken. I was broken and I was in a corner and I was crying and all I saw was death. All I wanted to do was die because I was tired and nobody understood me. And I tried doing it alone and, and doing it on my own and trying to, you know, just make my family work and focus on the things that I could control. But I didn't know I had this whole population of people who understood my trials and, and my suffering, right? And so when I went into therapy, broken up and crying in 2017, it was those veterans that I was in those groups with that I was crying and they were saying, sister, it's going to be okay. Sister, you won't have better days. And so for that, I feel like I'm just indebted to the, the veteran community because they helped me heal. We healed side by side. I can feel when someone's in pain. And if I say, hey, how you doing? They say, yeah, I'm good. I read behind the, yeah, I'm good. Um, and I've always been very good at that. However, when I got the assist training, applied suicide intervention skills training, um, I got trained actually down at the Wounded Warriors project uh but they had two fbi negotiators come in and do the training for us and just to hear their stories and i'm like oh my gosh it's so cool and then once i started doing them i realized okay well wait this really works every time that i do a suicide intervention i'm doing it the way that they taught me and it really flows this way okay this is this is this is an amazing tool. And so I took that along with my advocacy work at the Washington DC VA Medical Center sitting on the mental health advisory council at the Washington DC VA Medical Center as suicide prevention. Um, I began to because we were boots on ground. We were the advocators for the veterans when they, you know, um, were being treated unfairly and things like that. And we were out in the community feeding the homeless and we were putting together events to make sure that they're housed and employed and have their claims and benefits. I started to, to, to make these relationships, to build these relationships and bonds with the veterans that came before me, the Vietnam era veterans, the um, uh, I've even met a few World War II veterans that I am honored to have met. Um, and and when they see me, they see a ball of joy. I have a, a, a mama D about 
Mama D about 90 years old. She walked real slow down the hallway every Monday and Thursday, I promise you. But when she see, soon as she see me, oh, that's my baby doll. Give me a baby doll. You know, and I see her and I embrace her with so much love. And I'm like, Mama D, how are you? But that's how I, I greet everybody. And I pass on that love and that joy. But when veterans are having a hard time and they're struggling, they come, they come to me. They come to me because they know what I do. I've been in the community now for a few years. And so they know what I do and they come and they say, sis, I need to talk to you. And I'm always there. I'm always there. I'll put down whatever I'm doing to make sure that they're okay. Prior to entering the service, Memorial Day to me was time to cook out. It was time to make sure I had all the barbecue sauce and the ingredients ready to eat. Prior to serving, Memorial Day is such a heavy day for me. Um, even though I have I have not lost anybody to as to POW and or MIA, um, I have lost some friends in service um, in Iraq. I have lost some friends in service um, to suicide, um, and that day. It's a heavy day for me. It's the day where I remember those who gave that ultimate sacrifice. We all go over there and we sacrifice. We sacrifice our minds. We sacrifice our, our bodies. We sacrifice our families. When we come back home, we aren't the same as when we left. And you have those that gave that ultimate sacrifice. And I, I get really emotional around that time. I don't necessarily like to be around a lot of people during that time um, because it means something different for me. Um, and then I even think that a lot of people don't even understand the things that we've been through or lived through or the things that we, that we sacrifice for this country so that they can be safe, so that the civilians can be safe and That day for me represents a day of respect. Um, yeah. I want America to roll to remember the sacrifices that both male and women veterans made. I want them to be a little kinder. You never know what someone is going through. Rolling to remember our, our voices for sure and voices for women like Mama D who did not have a voice, who was not called a veteran or who today still have issues being identified as a veteran because when people think of veterans, they only think of men. Anytime a woman is in the vicinity of the VA. She's always considered to be a caregiver and or a spouse. I want our voices to be heard. I want our suicide rates to significantly plummet. I want them to roll to remember that it's okay not to be okay and to reach out. I want them to roll to remember <clears throat> those that are suffering so much to know that there is help. It's not gonna be easy, but it's not impossible. You can heal. Chris Earl, Graham True, singing soldiers, where are we going? Washington DC, baby. Oh yeah, Memorial Day weekend. See you out there, everyone. And the lights turn on and sirens roar To help the ones that we don't know Where my brothers and my sisters go To fight against the great unknown
salute the flag of red and white. It sacrificed so many lives. We're fighting for what we believe. I always stand on God for thee. Memorial Day, we remember the uh, men and women who have served our great nation and also the men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice. I often think of my buddy who died in my arm. My aircraft commander was Timothy Artman from Florida and he had plans of being a commercial pilot. Timmy was kind of a tall, lanky guy, good-natured, good sense of humor, and he wasn't only my pilot, but he was also my friend. On the uh, day of the incident, we were coming into what they refer to as a hot LZ. About treetop level, that's when we got nailed. The crossfire was so horrendous on both sides of the ship. Him and I got shot down. I know Timmy's hurt up front. I gotta you know, jump out of the ship and see how I can help him. And that's when there's a big explosion. He kept telling us, tell Janie he loves her, which is his wife. And I'm like, shut up. Tell your own wife you love her. We'll get out of this mess. I got him in my arm right here, and he looked at me and told Jane, and then he died. The war is uh, hellish. It's nothing to brag about. I remember I took what was left of my arm and kind of tucked it inside my pants so it wouldn't flop. And we had one medic that I found out that was alive on a little higher ground. So I'd kind of like skid the guys over by him so he could patch these guys up. Yeah, you know, I did that throughout the evening and I just chose to give it my best and, and do the best that I could. The President of the United States of America has awarded in the name of the Congress the Medal of Honor to Specialist for Gary G. Wetzel. And when I had the privilege to wear that blue ribbon, you know, I wear it for everybody, so it's part of all of us. It's personal on Memorial Day because we have certain friends that have given the ultimate sacrifice. I head down to Washington, D.C., what we refer to as Rolling Thunder. My bike is any different than anybody else's. I helped redesign my arm so I could pull my clutch in and out and ride that bike. And it's my independence. You, know, you sit on that iron horse, thousands of, of people waving, yelling, screaming. Here it's 49 years later. I go down to the wall, his name's there. 27E, line 80, that's where he's at. I gotta say what I gotta say to him because I have to. And uh, it's out of uh, respect and love for Timmy that, that I do that. So uh, that, that's what I do. We use that word freedom and but people don't realize that there's a price that's paid for it. Those men and women on that wall 
uh, but the same concept, the same beliefs and ideas that our forefathers did. We, we put our heart and soul into that flag for what it stands for. Look into that flag. Look into that flag and think about the sacrifices men and women have given you and I to be here. That's what it's all about. I'm Jean Somers. And I'm Howard. And we're the parents of uh, Sergeant Daniel Somers who took his own life back in June of 2013. And since then, we've been doing a lot of advocacy for veterans and service members in the hopes of stopping the um, pandemic of suicide. Um, Daniel was in the California Army National Guard, and he was assigned to a military intelligence unit. He was in Iraq 2004, 2005, and then went back again in 2007, 2008, and um, experienced many things that were very against his moral code. And Daniel left an amazing suicide letter that we took as our marching orders. And in his letter, he described his feelings, he described what he had experienced when he was actually in combat situations, and then what had been his perceived issues at VA, with VA, after he left the service. And so our whole point, as Gene has said, is what can we do to, first of all, help those who are in the service get through their service time without suffering the issues that Daniel encountered, and then what can we do to help people once they have attained veteran status? Uh, Daniel's issues were multi-symptom. Uh, he, he suffered from post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, moral injury, and Gulf War syndrome. And I once, uh, for a talk, made up a slide to try to explain all of the overlapping symptoms of those four issues. And they were immense, the number of overlapping. And I, I remember thinking at the time how difficult it must be to um, help, to be in the medical profession and try to help veterans that have all of these different issues and not, not really understanding what each veteran has, how much of this is post-traumatic stress versus uh, moral injury. So we like to say that um, people sympathize with our service members and veterans. What we need for them is to empathize. We are great at taking our men and women and creating warriors. We're not so great at taking our warriors and recreating civilians. Knowing really started with basic training. Um, so, you know, we, we, we know he's there and you can't have any communication with him right away. So you're a little anxious, maybe a mom a little bit more than a dad, just, you know, because, you know, the whole school and everything else, you, you, you feel like you, you, you went through that. So you know how to prepare them but you, you don't know how to prepare them for this. I had two brothers who served and our, both of our fathers served. And um, I, I, still, I, I still, I didn't experience it and they didn't really talk about it. So I, I didn't know how to prepare him. It was hard to be really excited about that. But obviously if somebody is going into the service, you know, we knew that that was something. But we spent our time in those phone calls basically listening to him regurgitate his experiences. What we didn't do was necessarily spend a lot of time saying, how did you feel about that? How did that affect you? Um, what, it, it, you know, what, I don't know, just physically, mentally, you know, what, how, what were the other uh, people doing? How did, what was their experience like? Did, did you talk about it with one another afterwards? Those would have been really good questions to help us understand his state of mind. 
that early, very early on. And to get us from that sympathize to empathize stage. What is the most frustrating thing to me is that we were completely helpless when Daniel was in his pre-suicide um, stage mm -hmm. and which lasted for years looking back on it. And I think what I would do now is I would confront him. I would say, honey, we see you. Are you really thinking of taking your own life? Are you really considering doing that? And, you know, you're afraid to say something like that to someone. But what we have learned in our journey is that that can be preventative is that if you see somebody who's really down, I mean, you literally, literally had a walk on eggshells around our son. I want your thoughts on how we can do a better job of, of using opportunities like Memorial Day to broaden our thinking about service and what it means. Well, regarding Memorial Day, pretty much every day is Memorial Day for us. Yeah. And um, there's not a day that goes by that we don't think of our son and think of the sacrifice that he made. And by doing that, it gives us an appreciation for all of the others who have put their names on the line and have volunteered, which is what they do now for our country. We are all individuals and we all have our own issues, our own problems, our own loves, our own dislikes. And that makes us all the same. On Memorial Day, I want America to roll to remember not only our son, but all veterans, everyone who, have ser who has served, everyone who has decided that America is worth a sacrifice and America should be able to afford our veterans and our service members the very best that this country has to offer when they're in the service, on veteran status, and wherever they may be, for as long as they are with us, they should absolutely be afforded and be given the very best that this country has to offer. Perfect. here playing a song I wrote called Home for all of our fallen heroes who have headed home. And this is my friend Chris Shocker playing a little saxophone for you. This one's called Home. I've been thankful for 
Chocolate chip cookies in my blue jeans. so thankful for all of our veterans. Thank you so much. We love America and thank you guys so much. Have an awesome Memorial Day and just remember to remember our fallen heroes. Hello, I'm Senator Joe Manchin. It is an honor to join you in celebration this Memorial Day. To all the riders across the nation who will participate in this year's Rolling to Remember ride, I salute you. As an avid rider myself, I intend to get my 22 miles in this weekend to remember our fallen service heroes and their families. Memorial Day holds a special place in our hearts as West Virginians. Francis Pierpont, a Fairmont native, played a key role in the birth of West Virginia as its own state. His wife, Julia, established Decoration Day in 1866 to honor the fallen soldiers of the Civil War. Decoration Day became a national celebration soon after and eventually became what we now know as Memorial Day. When visitors come to West Virginia, I jump at the chance to tell them, we are home to the most patriotic and hardworking people in the nation. We have always done the heavy lifting and never complained. We have mined the coal, forged the steel, that built the guns and ships and factories that have protected and continue to protect our country to this very day. Memorial Day and every day is an opportunity to recognize the members of our armed forces for their unrelenting commitment to protecting our great nation, as well as to remember the brave heroes yesterday who have made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom. For those serving today, we continue to pray for their safety and speedy return home to their families. It is because of all of our veterans, past and present, that we can proudly proclaim, Mountaineers are always free. These may be unprecedented times, but that much will always remain the same here in almost heaven, West Virginia. Thank you for your service, and God bless each and every one of you. My name is Kimberly Bailey, and I am a social worker in Fresno, California. My primary passion is veteran um, mental health, and so I also do a lot of volunteer work. Um, I do some volunteer work with um, as a crisis interventionist um, for the crisis text line. Um, I work in the veterans treatment court, helping to mentor female veterans with within the criminal justice system. Um, I also run a mini blog called Invisible Combat. It's on Facebook and Instagram, um, where I primarily just talk about my story and just opening up that dialogue that is so important for our community. Um, I also host, and this is a new thing for me, I host a podcast called the Shiro Hotline, um, which primarily focuses on military and first responder mental health. The interesting thing about the military, I feel like, is the camaraderie and family connections within the military, um, regardless of when we served. So. Of course, there's a personal impact for me when I think about my brothers or sisters in arms who were taken as prisoner, prisoners of war. And that's so, it's just a devastating thing to think about because some of them never returned home. I can't even imagine how traumatic that experience is or was and how traumatic it can continue to be um, for them and their families. Um, although some actually did come home, we know that oftentimes the battle didn't stop. They become, you know, they have an invisible battle with invisible wounds. And so that's something that I'm super passionate about um, talking about and opening that dialogue about because I think not enough people talk about the invisible portion of those battles. Um, so it's just really devastating to think about their experience. And it's painful to know that there are so many others who didn't have the opportunity to come home and heal. The mental health and the cognitive challenges that I was facing after my traumatic brain injury, um, you know, left me with 
a lot of challenges trying to just understand what had happened to me. The challenges that I faced went undiagnosed and untreated for a really long time. You know, I wouldn't say years after the incident happened because of the silence. I didn't talk about the situation. Um, so in 2007, while I was still on active duty, I started to feel pretty hopeless and invisible because I wasn't speaking about my trauma. And I attempted to end it by suicide. I was basically surviving by any means necessary. And what I mean by that is I was coping with, you know, maladaptive coping strategies, alcohol, drugs, um, things that you would think, you know, wouldn't be healthy for me, but it was the only way for me to like numb the pain and pretty much forget about all the things that happened to me. So unfortunately it ended up putting me into the criminal justice system um, a few different times. I was incarcerated for off and on about a year. And most people wouldn't know that by looking at me, but that's the story of my, you know, my life. I went to the VA, I got support for the first time ever. And I actually got a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder um, and the TBI as well that I had been, you know, basically suffering from for many years. And once that happened, it just made sense. Like I just knew there was nothing really wrong with me that it was just my human experience and my human reaction to traumatic experiences. I feel a par an unparalleled pride and admiration for my service members, my brothers and sisters who have been able to come out on the other side of that darkness. And I also, also feel sadness for those that are still stuck there, you know, but I also want to say that I feel hope because there is you know, there is so much potential and there's so much hope that you can come out of the darkness. I was a, a U.S. Army combat medic and I, of course, wanted to, I always knew that I wanted to be a helper, some sort of a, in a helping position. Um, so when I joined the military, of course, when the medic came up, I'm like, that's all me. I'm going, I want to be a medic. And so um, the, my first duty station was in Launchstall Regional Medical Center, which was the hospital overseas in Germany. We were primarily the only hospital. So from the battlefield, they flew directly into us and we would stabilize them and then we would transport them. And some of them didn't make it and some of them, a lot of them did. We had a really good success rate of people who survived. So when they got to us, oftentimes they were severely wounded. Um, we had to stabilize them and treat them oftentimes coming straight from the medevac or the helicopters, like literally directly from the battlefield. Um, and we had so many soldiers that came through. I mean, it was two in the morning, we would get the phone call that we needed to be on call for another mission that came through. And I can just remember those soldiers coming off of the airvacs or the medevacs um, really wounded and some of them not even able to speak or um, even conscious at the time, because a lot of them were heavily medicated um, with pain medicine, of course. Um, and as us as medics, we did our due diligence to make sure that they were as comfortable as comfortable as possible. You know, we held their hands, we talked to them, we encouraged them. Um, we even had family that used to come down. They would get flown in, so oftentimes they were entering the same time that you know the soldiers were coming in. So we had multiple hats. We had to kind of tra trade them, whoever we were dealing with. Were we dealing with a soldier that needed encouragement? We would encourage them. Were we dealing with a family member that needed to be consoled? We would console them. Um, and so often, because we had so many soldiers coming in, we oftentimes don't know what happened to them. They would come through. We would have them like literally just in the waiting hall just waiting for triage and we would have to just be working diligently like, really quickly. But the funny thing is about that is that even not even knowing them, not knowing their names, not knowing who they are, not even being able to have a conversation with them, um, a lot of us felt super connected with them just because um, we don't know where they came from. We don't know who they were. We don't know where they were going or if they were even going to make it. But we that was our brother right that was our sister that was somebody who um could have been one of us and um just not knowing what has happened to them after they left us was 
pretty much um, was really traumatic for a lot of us. And I don't think we talked a lot about it because we didn't do a lot of, well, we did debriefings, of course, after every mission. But I think the the piece that was missing was being able to process that um, that grief, basically. We were grieving for the loss of even knowing who that person was. Um, and because so many were coming in, in the beginning stages of the war, we didn't have the opportunity to follow up with them and find out. And I think for a lot of individuals or families who have soldiers who are missing in action or um, never had the opportunity to return, I think um, it's that missing closure piece where they just don't know what happened. Did they make it? Did they not make it? Um, hopefully they had amazing lives and you can picture that and hope for the best, but oftentimes we never got that closure. So I can just imagine how that would feel like um, to have, you know, your comrade even, or, um, you know, a family member where you just don't know what happened to them. So I want America to roll to remember those individuals who are standing up in the face of this crisis or any crisis and taking the time to remember others and heal others, um, even with their own, you know, traumatic history or past trauma. I want America, I want America to, roll to, to, remember roll to remember the veterans, the veterans who, are who are surviving by any means necessary, who are, who are hanging, are on, hanging by thread, on by a thread, who are, who are just just in that dark, in that dark, don't know how to don't know how to get out. Um, because those, um, because are, those the are the ones that, that need to go back and to go back and save. Because my message is to help those who are suffering from mental illness, PTSD, because it does exist. And though I may not have seen what a lot of people I know out there have seen, I've seen enough that affected me, and I was drinking a lot. And if it wasn't for the help of a chaplain I went to, I probably wouldn't be here today. And I didn't go see that chaplain. And the only reason why I did is because a shipmate helped me out. And we all need that guiding light, that hope, that torch to kind of help carry people forward. Now there's, uh, I can't remember the crisis helpline now for those who are battling PTSD, but they do have crisis helplines for su suicide and mental awareness. And I hope you guys out there will help problem is, is that a lot of people don't know what to do to help. They can help you out, figure out how to help somebody else. But if you see someone, or if you were yourself, my biggest problem is I thought, I can handle it, I can take it. It wasn't until after I started talking to a chaplain that I realized that I did need help. And I hope that you guys see a six foot three military veteran guy talking openly about what he has went through, that every one of you will go out there and seek the help you so rightly deserve. It's not a bad thing to ask for help, it's a good thing because we lose way too many people to suicide and, pet and PTSD. So if you know somebody or if you yourself are out there struggling, please go out there and maybe play this song for them because this is a kind of an anthem for those who suffer. This one's called, They Said He Wasn't Hurt. He closed his eyes held on tight as those bombs went off behind enemy lines he lost a lot of friends that night but he made it through his final fight they sent him home a hero cause he fought and never once gave up Defending the country that he loved He said he wasn't hurt He'll never be the same He's got no battle scars He's forever changed He's got a silver star And a face for his hard work They call it a miracle They said he wasn't hurt He still wakes up At 4 a.m. Says a prayer Like he always did He's trying hard To fit back in Be a husband to his wife And a father to his kids 
scars, but he's forever changed. He's got a silver star, and the thanks for his hard work, they call it a miracle. He's forever changed. He's got a silver star and a place for his hard work. They call it a miracle. They call it a miracle. Said he wasn't hurt. My name is Robin Fortner, Sergeant Major Fortner, United States Marine Corps. Um, I'm serving currently at the Marine Corps Systems Command here at Quantico, Virginia. That's the headquarters Marine Corps unit. It's actually in charge of uh, the acquisition piece for the Marine Corps. We equip the Marines with ground information, um, ground equipment, and information warfare as well. So my job right now is not just to be the senior enlisted advisor, to the Marines and the civilians there, but also to be that influencer to make sure that they understand what the subject matter expert needs on the ground. At the same time, I keep my ear to the ground to what the MAGTAP needs and what they're asking for, um, make sure that their voice is heard. Another side piece that I like to do at my job now is educate, educate the force as to what the Marine Corps Systems Command can do for them and how they can help be a part of all the Marines there helping to, 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 to make sure that the industry gets the gear right. And you, you deployed, um, I don't know how many times during, I mean, since 9-11. Yeah. You talked about, uh, before you even come to appreciate what Memorial Day means because of loss, you go into these situations knowing that there's a level of danger, yet you still have to lead. You know, you still have to be a visible uh, sense of comfort for people. So can you talk about maybe the lead up, you know, maybe even start with 9-11 and, and what, what was your mind and the people around you? Yeah, so when I think about 9-11, so let me just back up a little bit. I'm originally from New York City, um, born and raised. So when 9-11 hit, it became more of a personal, you know, as well as professional hit for me. I remember just being stunned. I remember just watching it just like everybody else, but my concern was trying to get a hold of my family. So I took it very, very, very hard from the very beginning, I was actually on the drill field at the time that 9-11 hit. We happened to be in the squad bay at that same time. So moving forward as a leader, even that's the reason why I put that picture up behind me. You know, a recruit drew that picture. And I, and I just remember everything we learned about training recruits, although that sticks with you, but because there was a world conflict going on right then and there in the midst of training, it became even more imperative that we, we, we taught them the mindset, that warrior mindset from the very beginning. So when I got that picture from a recruit after she was graduating, it hit home that what I was doing was the right thing to do, that we, we made sure we incorporated all those tenants, not just to be something they repeat back, but those tenants that they started to feel inside their heart. Because I knew, and I would always teach them and, 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 and get into their heads, that when you leave Paris Island, it begins. The real work begins. And, and it was absolutely positive that many of them would find themselves in harm's way. Many of them would find themselves on the combat soil, and they did. So as a leader, you know, leading up to any kind of conflict, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to teach it and it's easy to say it, but it really is difficult to really get into their head. You know, that coaching and teaching that mentorship it, it, it pays off when you can see it on the opposite end, that, that they understand this is real. 
um, and lives are at stake. We, we depend on each other for a reason. We teach that, that, that type of mindset for a reason. And here it was live smack in their faces, just like a saw itching, itching to get over there to make sure what we said, we would defend our country against enemies every single day. You know, that was something we was all ready to do. Because newer generations are so disconnected from POW and MIA, it hadn't happened in the recent conflict as much. We want to we want to kind of recontextualize POW and MIA to focus on veteran suicide, which means those who are POW are, are held in crisis. They're they're at a war with themselves, and they're held prisoner. And this threat of suicide lingers. And those who are MIA are those who actually took their lives. So can you can you talk about um, not that we want to elevate suicide to the same level of, of combat loss? But there, but there has to be a place for us to honor folks who served and came back so broken that they couldn't, and I don't want to use that word broken, but they were broken if they took their lives. What is it about their plight as people who served, endured hardship, and now come back that, that we often miss? Just look at the statistics. When I think about POWs first, if I can kind of back up on that, I mean, just, just POW, even though it hasn't been as prevalent in our time frame, it, 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 it amazes me how many were captured and what it took for them, you know, to survive, if they did survive and for however long they did, you know. Um, we, we, we throw around the word courage a lot, right? But we're not always tested to the extreme on courage. And I think POW is one great extreme test of courage and tenacity and determination and commitment to your service, your core, your country. One of the reasons why we hold this event is to protest Congress, is to protest, uh, not protest for the sake of protest, but they can always be doing better. So what are some of the things that you would want this Congress to do better on by those Marines that you've trained and has, have influenced, but now they have to do it on their own? I, I would say if I can protest and walk into a Capitol is, let me put a pack on your back and some boots on you, and let me take you out to where the rubber meets the road, and let me let you feel a little bit of the hardship, the adversity, feel a little bit of sweat, understand and listen to the man and the woman next to you, is I need this equipment, this uh, uh, rifle, whether it's this clothing, whether it's this law to change so that I can do X, Y, Z. Um, one, because at the end of the day, it's for the nation, it's for the country, and they really need to understand this. I, I always try to get to a root. One of the root, I think, for Congress is they're too far removed. They're, too, they're just too far removed from the military, from the warrior mindset. They're just too far removed. And part of that is because I just don't think we have enough congressmen and women, representatives up, up on the hill. Think about the end of this phrase. Uh, I want America to roll to remember blank. Uh, I would love, I want America to roll to remember that Freedom is just not free. And there are many people out there willing to ensure that our freedom is, is, is as seamless as we can make it, but that comes with a price. So as we continue to, to enjoy ourselves out there, take some time to remember whether you know a name or not know a name, just knowing that there are people out there defending this country every day, even today, whether it's in a cyber IW war, or is on the ground. There is somebody out there with our country in mind who stood and raised their hand and said, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, whether foreign or domestic. And I do that and I bear true faith. Um, you may not understand it to the full complexity, but understand the air you breathe and the fact that you can sit and have a barbecue every day is not lost on souls that have been that has been lost throughout these years so thanks for the opportunity sherman i really really appreciate it it's you know absolutely a great way to end the segment it is it, it's fitting it hits it hits home to me um and i would love the, the the fact that everybody understands that whether you're in a uniform i chose to put on civilian clothes today but i wanted to show in the back that we still represent america 365 to 365 days a year you know, this, this is our country. And if I can ask anything else, whether it's Memorial Day or not, our country means no matter what you look like, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, we have got to unite. 
I joined the Marine Corps in 1966 because it was something I was supposed to do. I was up at 2.30 this morning. I came home from Vietnam today, 1968. Two weeks before, it was the day I was supposed to be killed, I think. That's what I believe. So the fact that I came home was kind of a miracle in its own. Some of my friends didn't. Those two guys right there. Peter Armstrong, Vincent Santanello. This morning at 2.30, like I said, I woke up. It's interesting. Um, sometimes the soldiers sit in the stack over on my flat file for a while because I want to draw them when they want to be drawn. I've done it over 4,500 of these, but I want the art to be so clean and so right for the family that um, I've learned now that if a picture doesn't want to be drawn yet, it doesn't get drawn yet. Um, so that's why I'm doing Eldon right now. Eldon Arcon. And uh, he's beautiful. When I came home from Vietnam, I knew I had this debt. I just didn't know what it was. Tr trying to pay back my friends and trying not to forget them. Although uh, most of us who came over again now were running as fast as we could to be somebody else. This was my destiny. It's a sad thing to think about, but the day before someone has to draw my portrait would be the last day I draw a portrait of a fallen hero. I'd sit here for really all those hours for nothing. Um, other than the fact that this human being died for me, and he didn't know me. I have to ground myself after learning as much as I learn about these people and drawing their portraits and doing my best to get some part of them home. I need to take a break. I need to actually pull myself away to prepare for tomorrow, because tomorrow there'll be two more. What this offers me is reality the air and the eagles and the dogs and the people and it's something that's right now put there to make me able to I don't know how else to say this break my heart again tomorrow you know I use pencils I'm writing a story um, I'm not I may be doing a portrait but believe me when I tell you I'm writing a story I'm trying, I'm writing a story between this young man and me. I'm writing a story between this young man letting me do this portrait. I'm writing a story that I don't even know what I'm writing. It's the message he wants to take home to his family. It's the message they will see when they get this picture, and I guarantee you they will. Every one of my pencils ends up telling a story of someone who died for me. Died for all of us. Love allows you to do things that you can't necessarily explain. When I start my drawings, I always put my fingers on this cross and I just say a prayer that I can do the best I can do. Um, because there's a message, like I said, that has to go home and that message isn't something I'm gonna know, but it is going to be something that does go home with this picture. But can't you see it in his face that he wants to get out of here? <laughs> he wants to go someplace where else he's supposed to be. He wants to go where he's needed, that's the word. He's needed. I, I do want to say this, Danny. This winter, my heart broke because you've gone through a couple of difficult years being 22, the same age as Eldon when he died, and outliving your brother. And so I wrote to this man and I asked him to do something. I'm giving it to you. <sighs> Oh, that's beautiful. That's just beautiful. That's beautiful. I know I can't give you back your brother, but I can give you a beautiful portrait of him. Oh, it's beautiful. This is beautiful.
thousands of POWs fought for the red, white, and blue from the air, land, and sea and broke the chains of tyranny, rolling thunder. Countless numbers of MIAs lost and laid in unmarked graves. Tears pour from the eagle's eyes. More politics and more damn lies, rolling thunder. Roll, 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 rolling thunder. Roll, roll, roll to remember. Twenty-two more will die today with the pain engraved on their face. An American tragedy. And another family grieves, rolling thunder. Roll, 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 rolling thunder. Roll, roll, roll to remember. And there ain't no way in hell we're ever gonna forget. Never forget. We'll see you at the AMVETS Rolling to Remember um, Washington, D.C. Memorial Day weekend in 2021. Never, never forget. My name's Conrad Jeffries. I'm from American Falls, Idaho. <laughs> I joined the Coast Guard in uh, September of 2001. Um, did four years in the Coast Guard, really loved it, active duty. 2006, I joined the Idaho Army National Guard as a combat engineer. Um, 2009, I deployed with uh, JSOC, Joint Special Operations. I was attached to them. I was never a special guy. But we just uh, PSD, drove them around Baghdad, uh, came back home, competed in one soldier year in 2013. Uh, and then in 2016, I was discharged after a DUI. And uh, Memorial Day to me is very significant especially at this time in our country, I think that we forget um, that those colors and our freedoms were written in blood. And now more than ever, we need to come together as Americans. And, you know, the, the brothers and sisters I served with, there's just a common denominator between us. And it's that value of sacrifice and honor. And I'm hopeful at the end of um, this, when we get to this Memorial Weekend with everything that's going on in our country, um, my motto with my project is, is I still believe in the American spirit. And I always will. I know it's there. I've seen it. I've seen it in the Coast Guard out on small boats late at night in search and rescue missions. I've seen it in training, you know, out in Bradley Gunnery with, with these guys, you know, sacrificing time with family, sacrificing this, sacrificing that, all for minimum wage because of the love for the country and that flag when it's put on your shoulder it means something and when i had it taken off mine it was devastating you know that's i stood for something at one time and so as a veteran memorial day is a chance for me to be around my brothers and sisters and to honor the sacrifices that have gone on in this country and with this coronavirus thing our, our suicide rates have gotten worse our veterans are more subjective to um, some of these life layers that cause mental health issues, divorce, financial problems. So I think Memorial Day is also an important day for us to reach out to one another, check in on our battle buddies, you know, stuff like that. Uh, now more than ever, Memorial Day has to be about honoring the country and the men, men and women that protect it looking at these different factors of why we're taking our lives. I know when I went through my struggles, um, you know, I never really, I never saw combat in, in Iraq. I didn't, we were, we were hauling around JSOC, but we were real successful. And 
never saw nothing. We had some first infantry guys get hit in front of us once, but you know, I struggled with some PTSD from search and rescue in the Coast Guard. And I think in the first responder community and even in the military community, a lot of us sign up to be that hero. <laughs> you know, when someone dies on you during CPR or you're overseas and there's collateral damage maybe, and we see certain things, it's just hard to take that out of your backpack. That's just one of those rocks that we carry, right? I was supposed to be a hero and they died. That's not what we planned for. That's not why we signed up, but that's the reality of life. And you know, I had a good, in that situation, I had a really good senior chief that had obviously been through that before who kept an eye on me. I was real young, 22 maybe, but that brotherhood exists for a reason and we need to strengthen it, not only in ranks, but out of ranks. And what better day than Memorial Day to really, you know, do something significant with that American spirit. Together we're unstoppable and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful this Memorial Day, we really focus on that, the American spirit. I really believe in it. It's there, it's alive and well. I see it on social media. I see it in the streets. You know, there's, there's a lot of negative going out out with, with, with our country and what's going on right now. But there's also a lot of positive. And as veterans, I'd like to see us own that. I think it's important we roll to remember our history as Americans. From Private Treptow in World War I, carrying a note and getting killed. From our Navy in World War II, Midway, our 101st Airborne Division jumping behind enemy lines. The Korean War, where we were fighting the Chinese, by the way. Vietnam, where we recruited some of the poorest, poorest Americans with nothing. And they went over to a country and fought in a jungle warfare against an ungodly, well-trained, highly efficient guerrilla warfare army. And the atrocities of being in those jungles that, that are those Vietnam guys went through, we have to remember whether politically we believe in, in, in that or not. That wasn't who was fighting, that was the American, that was your neighbor, perhaps it was your uncle. I would ask every American as we're rolling, remember, look at your family lineage. For God's sakes, how many people in there are a cop or served in one of our, our conflicts or war? Roll to remember that that we still have people taking their lives because of that. Roll to remember that. Roll to remember what we stand for as a country. Do we stand for this, what's going on now? Or are we proud to be Americans? Are we proud of our armed forces and what our first responders and um, our nurses and doctors and everyone that makes this country function down to the person at Starbucks or the Jackson's gas station to um, a captain of an infantry unit. We need to roll to remember that none of that is guaranteed. We're not entitled to any of it. And we need to roll to remember our history. I got a six string rifle wrapped around my neck, marching to a drum that I can't forget. Ten more rounds of alcohol, drowning my sorrow from another war. I play my music for God and country. I play it loud so the memories won't harm me. Dragging my ass through the mud and the rain, singing every song that Hank ever sang. I tell my stories to the ones who love me. I fly the flag and I serve my country and do it all again. That's who I am. I've got a bulletproof smile you can see right through It covers up the lies and it hides the truth Up he sees me down, pour another round down range I'm driving black Cadillacs, not as rich as you think Walking to the bar just to buy my next drink Thunder running through my mind From a past that I left behind I play my music for God and country i play it loud so the memories won't haunt me dragging my ass through the mud and the rain singing every song that hank ever sang i tell my stories to the ones who love me i fly the flag and i serve my country and do it all again that's who 
who I am. Greetings from Washington, D.C. My name is Elliot Tomingo. I spent 14 years in the Marine Corps. <laughs> Hurrah. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser. I have the honor of serving as Mayor Bowser's Director for Veteran Affairs, ensuring D.C.'s 30,000 veterans and their family members receive the services, programs, and advocacy they deserve. For 32 years, your rolling thunder has brought honor to our fallen brothers and sisters, maintained hope for those still missing, and rose awareness of the 22 veterans lose every day to suicide. Your safety and health is Mayor Bowser's priority. We know that you'll adapt and accomplish the mission. So on May 24th, make those engines loud and complete the Rolling to Remember Challenge by riding 22 miles in your local community. Thank you to AMVETS for hosting this great tradition. Thank you for serving our country and never giving up the fight. And we look forward to seeing you all in 2021. Semper Fi. John, before he went to the VA, he had actually went to his old unit, the 230th, uh, and asked him about the possibility of re-enlisting so he could get another deployment. Uh, I know the deployment was his finest hour. He was a different person before he went, and he was a different person for the best when he came back. It was after that that he started going downhill. So by taking that, trying to take that next deployment, I think that he was trying to regain a piece of himself. But when he decided to go to the VA for treatment, like he and I discussed, he said, you know, I can't, I can't have their back if I can't have mine. I need to fix myself first. When you lose a loved one that was a veteran, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's horrible to get the news that you've lost them in combat overseas. But it's just as horrible that you get the news you've lost them five miles from home. I'm not trying to compare myself, but I'm just trying to, you know, let people know that there's no, when you lose a, a loved one that was a veteran, it's the same pain. We were extremely proud when he graduated from boot camp. Uh, me and, and Susan and his grandparents, uh, yes, it was extremely proud to see him graduate. Uh, I've still got his graduation picture. Uh, and his unit, uh, the group he graduated with, I still have it in there. Uh, I've kept all of his military pictures and I'm proud of every one of them. Uh, I mean, whether the pictures he took in Afghanistan or, or boot camp, uh, that's something I'll hang on to forever because it just, every time I see him, there's a mixed feeling of, it makes me sad because he's not here anymore, but I'm still extremely proud of him just like I was the day I saw the pictures. Did you notice a, a change for the better in him when you saw him graduate and he came home for the first time and you kind of see, did you, did you notice any kind of uh, evolution? Oh, sure. There was a, when he first came home after graduation from boot camp, I mean, there were, you could tell there was some uh, pride in himself. Uh, and uh, he was, you know, anxious to get, you know, into the full swing of things. You know, I spent year, two years reading over records, uh, everything I could find and, and, and oh, kept reading over his last note to me, basically his goodbye note. John read the Quran so he could understand what it meant. He wasn't Muslim. Uh, he wasn't really Christian. He was spiritual. Uh, so he read it so he could understand their way of thinking. And that was just the way he was. Uh, he, he was incredibly smart. But, and this is another thing I'd like to touch on. As far as a veteran giving up, uh, I didn't have the signs that night that he has given up. I mean, he, he seemed like a, a quarterback that had just lost the Super Bowl, but he also had a plan the next day. So that's the reason it never occurred to me that that was even a thought that night. 
So, like I said, sometime during the night it went wrong. But here's something I, I want to mention that I may have mentioned to you, but I actually mentioned to Representative Dagerley's office. I think if the government, the or the DOD, the VA get together, and for you know yourself, for every uh, vet, uh, every service member deployed, you've got a next of kin you have to fill out. If they just mail a small pamphlet to that next of kin, uh, showing the signs, it could be just a piece of paper folded over, but the signs of PTSD and uh, uh, traumatic brain injury and the signs of depression. Think about it. When that veteran comes home, that family is going to have kind of like something they can say, well, wait a minute, John's acting strange. Well, not only that, but if they read this, they can tell if their next door neighbor is acting strange or their, their child in school is acting strange. And it's, it wouldn't cost billions, just a folded over piece of paper so that the American public that's not familiar with veteran suicide or PTSD and the warning signs, then they're going to have a bigger grasp on it. Join the Navy because I had to get away from a boring life to something how to change. Signed up on Friday and I left. Signed him on one of the ventures. So I headed for the storm. When I got to boot camp, I thought, Lord, what have I done? They took my guitar, they handed me a gun. And I made it through, and I marched out. Hello, I'm Veterans Affairs Secretary Robert Wilkie. For 32 years, Memorial Day has meant the roar of rolling thunder across our national mall. Hundreds of thousands of patriots united the nation and drew attention to America's POWs and MIAs. Rolling thunder has been a constant reminder that we sleep soundly at night 
because of the sacrifices of those in uniform. This Memorial Day weekend, Ann Betts is working to make sure the Rolling Thunder legacy keeps reverberating in cities and towns across America with its Rolling to Remember Challenge. Ann Betts Rolling to Remember 2020 also brings attention to one of President Trump's top priorities, addressing the tragedy of veteran suicide. As we work through the coronavirus epidemic, every veteran and family member should know that VA is open for business, providing same-day mental health services and mental health screening for all veterans at risk. In fact, we've seen a dramatic jump in virtual mental health care services. In a normal month, we perform 40,000 mental health teleappointments. In March, we held 154,000 appointments by video. Virtual appointments at vet centers and telehealth group therapy jumped by 200%. Those numbers are a good sign. Veterans are successfully getting care despite the epidemic's challenges. If you or a veteran you know needs assistance, our Veterans Crisis Line is there to help. Just call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1, or text 838-255, or chat online at veteranscrisisline.net. In the Bible, God promised Joshua, I will not fail nor forsake thee. VA will never fail nor forsake our veterans, former POWs, MIAs, and their families and survivors. And we won't stop fighting for the real solutions to the veteran suicide crisis. Ride safely. Take good care of yourselves and take good care of each other. Thank you. My name is Sheila Mitchell Murphy and I am a Gold Star mom. As far as Memorial Day, I really didn't understand the importance of Memorial Day until I became a Gold Star mom. I too, like so many others in this nation, you know, look at Memorial Day as a day off of work, you know, a day to have hamburgers, hot dogs, to catch a deal on a vehicle or furniture. But when I got that knock on the door, it changed my whole perspective about what Memorial Day is because truth be told, I live Memorial Day every single day of my life because all I do is think about my son, about he would be 25 years old, May 17th. And I'm like, how would he look? You know, what would he say? What would he be doing now? And that's all I can think about. So in my mind, he's memorialized to me every single day because I'm missing him so much. So I just want America to know that my son and so many other fallen heroes, they fought for us because of what they believed in. And they went there without any type of fear, without any type of regards to their life, because the protection of their country was more to them than their life. And that's what Memorial Day is to me. I want America to roll to remember my son, Specialist FTM Murphy, as a man who had purpose, as a man with a vision, as a man who loved his country, as a man who fought and stood for what he believed in without any regards to his own safety or life. My son, Specialist Etienne Murphy, is the epitome of the American soldier. My heart goes out to those who never really were able to receive closure because maybe their loved one may not have made it back home. I can't imagine not seeing my son, but I can imagine it in a way because when I looked at my son in that casket, I couldn't accept that, that that's not my son. In my mind, my son is still out there somewhere and I'm waiting for him to come home. What are your thoughts on mental health serving and how that might turn into a situation where a veteran in crisis may be at, in a battle within him or herself? I, for one, have even thought about dying by suicide. I have even want, I have put a gun up to my heart and almost pulled that trigger. You can get to a point in your life 
or you feel like no one understands. I can't even imagine the atrocities that these heroes have seen and then to come back home and be shunned and be silenced because they feel like no one is going to understand how they're feeling, it hurts my heart to my core because I just wanna help them all. I may not understand what they've seen, what they've been through, but I do understand that feeling of not wanting to be here because you feel alone, because those thoughts in your mind can just take over. It becomes like a, a entity, like a spirit, and it can just make you believe that there's no more hope for you, that there's no more relief, and that the only way out of this is to leave this world. And I think more needs to be done for these veterans, for these young children, for these older people who are struggling with PTSD and depression because it's real. I've experienced it, but mine is no way half as bad as what they're experiencing because I don't know what they've been through over there. So all I can do is pray for them and I pray that the word can be spread more about what these heroes are going through on a daily, it's a battle every day, every second of their life, because I'm battling it as I speak. I'd like to thank AMVET. I would like to give a special thank you to Sherman Gillins Jr. I hope I'm saying his name correctly, but he is a godsend to me. I met Sherman when I responded to a post about veterans not really receiving the recognition or not really receiving what they need to receive in order to get help. Because I felt the same way as a Gold Star parent. There is minimum help for us out there. And Sherman responded to me and asked me, I just, is there anything we can do to help make life better? At first I said no, because I'm like, who is this guy? Because I don't believe it. So many people have said, oh, we'll help you. I never hear from them. But then it stayed on my heart a couple of days. And I said, I'm just going to put it out there. Okay, I said, yes, yes, Sherman, I want to ask you, I have all these posts. Everyone says you should put them in your book. I said, is there any way you can help me? I am not lying. I asked Sherman this, I think it was in January, and I think by March, the book was published. <laughs> so I am so thankful to AMVETS. I tell everyone that I know about AMVETS, I respect what they're doing, and they are number one in my book. Thank you, AMVETS, for all that you do.
Tom McNamara. I'm the national president of the AMVETS Riders, a subordinate group of the Veterans Service Organization, AMVETS. I'd like to talk to you about Rolling to Remember 2020. This is about the 81,000 service members that have not come home and we need to hold the government accountable. We would also like to talk about what is forefront in our minds is veteran suicide. 22 a day is too many. One is too many. We need to be working with the VAs to find a solution to this. So I was researching, looking for a poem about POW MIA. And I ran across one. It's simple. It's a poem by Del Abe Jones. And there's a few lines in it that really kind of hit home. So I'd like to read it to you. It's called POW MIA Issue. Ten years of bits and pieces by some people who still care. In search for clues and answers about those we left over there. Trying to get the military and all those politicians to take actions to find them with calls, letters, and petitions. It's a sad state of affairs when the family and friends must lead the battle in the search in this war that never ends. All those loved ones still missing who went to war for me and you deserve more from our country than just the efforts of those few. Thank you. Again, I'm Tom McNamara of the legendary AMVETS Riders. My name's Elizabeth Davis, and I am in the Northern Virginia area near Quantico. Um, I am a, the surviving widow of First Lieutenant Matthew Davis, United States Marine. He was killed in the line of duty on November 7th of 2014. Um, since his death, I have taken it upon myself to advocate for the Gold Star community. Um, I'm very passionate about making sure that the next waves of widows and orphans are taken care of and have as little bureaucracy to go through as humanly possible. So for our family, Memorial Day um, is exactly what it sounds like. It's a day to remember and reflect on the, the life and the service and the sacrifice of our hero, um, in this case, my husband. Um, we take the time to really reflect on the lives of close friends and family um, that have also paid the ultimate sacrifice or um, given their life in, in other capacities. So it, it's not just a, a holiday. Certainly we take the time to enjoy ourselves and be together and you know make memories with one another, but we do carve out time to memorialize those who cannot join us on that weekend. The evening of November 6th, 2014, Matt was on duty. Um, he was officer of the day. We had plans the following day to, you know, he would get off at 7 or 8 a.m. I'd come pick him up from work and we were going to go to Arizona and, and get like a first real weekend together. Um, we were newlyweds. So I made a habit um, when he would have duty, which was pretty frequently, to go have dinner with him. I'd bring dinner for him and whoever else was on duty with him. Um, and that night I went and had dinner with him and stayed till about 8 45 um, and then I guess some drama kicked off and he said he needed to go and you know why don't I just go on home because typically I would have just waited for him to come back to his office um, what I ended up finding out when I didn't hear from him and when he was no longer responding to text messages is uh, it was really really early in the morning I had a hard time going to sleep um, and I, I guess it, it, like the sun hadn't come up, it, it was pitch black early in the morning and I get a phone call from a very good friend of ours who serves with Matt or served with Matt in two five, um, and said, you know, Elizabeth, it's, it's Keegan. I, I need you to come down to the door. And I said, is everything okay? And he said, I just need you to come down to the door. And I knew at that moment that Matt had at minimum been hurt, um, so when I opened the door and it was two of his friends from that unit in their dress blues, I, I knew at that moment what that meant. Um, growing up in a Marine Corps family, you kind of are continually prepped for the what ifs, but the shift from being a Marine daughter to a Marine wife really changes your perspective on that. And never in you know generations of service did I ever think that I would get that knock on the door. And I did. Um, so it just, it was very surreal, almost foggy to go from, um, 
you know, just to realize that I had gone from a wife to a widow literally overnight. Uh, Matt was 30. I was 27. We were young. I started advocating for Gold Star families, oddly enough, when I came home to Virginia from California. Um, and it all, this, this whole process initiated with a trip to the DMV. Um, to make a long story short, all I asked for was Gold Star plates. And they said, well, you don't qualify because your husband, um, at the time, they're their limitations on that were that you had to die on foreign soil. It didn't have to be a combat theater. It just had to be foreign soil. Um, so I just kind of dropped it. I was like, all right, well, may I please have Marine Corps plates for my, my vehicle? Um, and I knew that I qualified for them, but the lady at the DMV desk said I didn't. So I contacted my senator and was like, hey, I'm not trying to cause a problem here. I just really like USMC plates to honor my late husband. Um, and from there, I started working with my senator and my delegate, and we actually redefined Gold Star families in the Commonwealth of Virginia and created a new next of kin plate. So that way families who fell outside of those um, foreign soils and combat theater deaths could be represented and their loved ones could be memorialized as well. From there, I started working on um, trying to ensure that kitties or you know, there's a thing called the kitties tax and making sure that our orphans are not taxed at you know, outrageous rates. Um, another hope of mine is that we will abolish the age restriction on remarriage. Currently, Gold Star spouses are penalized if they dependent on benefit, um, if they remarry before the age of 55 or 57. So in my, my circumstance, I have both of those benefits. So my, my age to remarry would be 57. So looking back on that, you know, I, I was 27 when my husband was killed. That means I've got 30 years, three decades of waiting before I can, you know, create a whole family again and reenter the Institute of Marriage without some sort of financial penalty. Growing up in a, um, specifically a Marine Corps household, because um, both my parents served, but my mother, um, I guess, stopped serving after my brother and I came along, she was in the army. Um, you might find this funny. My dad was a sergeant in Hawaii at the time and my mother got um, bored being on the island and commissioned into the army. <laughs> so <laughs> Lieutenant Grow and Sergeant Grow were happily living their lives in Hawaii when I came along. <laughs> so, um, but growing up in a Marine Corps household, um, I think it's really shaped my ability to be empathetic to other cultures and to other people and to maintain um, a sense of loyalty to my friends and family and associates. For families who are you know, trying to cope through loss via you know, prisoners of war and missing in action, um, I would imagine it, it is just a hard road to ride where you're kind of straddling um, absolute devastation, but all the while trying to maintain hope that, you know, eventually they're going to come home in some capacity. Um, you know, you always hope that they come home alive, well, and whole, but if nothing else, just having those remains so that you can have that closure and, and know where your loved one is. Um, I cannot imagine how desperate and just tragic it is to feel this sense of knowing that, you know, a piece of you is, is off in the world somewhere and you don't know what their well-being is. In October, a very dear friend of mine who um, was a Marine Corps veteran committed suicide. And this gentleman had been um, instrumental in my well-being and generally just my care and being a good friend to me after the loss of my husband. And um, in October of 2019, he very unexpectedly committed suicide. Um, and it, it was devastating to his, you know, to his ex-wife, to his daughter, to his parents, to his, his sister, to his cousins, his whole family, our, you know, our, our friend network. It was truly devastating because we didn't see it coming. And looking back, it's like, well, maybe there were signs and I failed to miss them. And, you know, maybe I should have pushed harder or read them differently. Um, it makes you second guess, even just from the friend realm. So I can't imagine how intense that feeling is from a biological family standpoint, or even, you know, a romantic relationship standpoint, 
um, it, it's just devastating to lose someone that way, to see them survive so many combat deployments, to see them go do dangerous jobs, um, you know, for the government as civilians once they come out or any number of, of opportunities that they take. It's just, you know, you come home and you survive so much and to see them be lost to that, it's, it is an additional layer of just tragedy that I almost can't articulate. What I learned from that experience is um, I find myself stepping up when I'm, you know, just instinctually concerned about someone or let's say they um, throw something out on a social media platform that is worrying. I don't hesitate to reach out. I don't brush it off as, um, oh, well, you know, he's got a dark sense of humor or whatever. I, I reach out immediately. Um, and there's been instances where, you know, I, I maybe even reach out to that individual's family if I'm um, truly concerned and I'm seeing big red markers. Um, I just, I, I don't think I could live with myself knowing that I didn't try or that I didn't try harder um, because that's the thing I, I learned through that loss was just try harder. Be present, be compassionate, be a good listener. You know, I'm not there to give them advice and solve all their problems, but I want them to know that they're not alone and that I'm here and that they can call or you know, knock on my door. I'm, I'm here. I, I would rather be up in the middle of the night with them than attending a funeral for them. I would like America to roll to remember my husband, First Lieutenant Matthew Davis, and all of his brothers and sisters in arms who have paid the ultimate sacrifice both on and off duty. Um, thank you so much. Here we go. A rolling down the runway, staring out the window, red eye out of L.A. nonstop to Chicago. Another long cab ride, another hotel room. Your picture in my pocket, I still smell your perfume. Living out of a suitcase, different town every day, another sold out show, 15 minutes of fame. Half guitar will travel, my Gibson on my back. Get the party started, one man open an act. Damn, I hate the leaving, but I love the coming back. I'm your forever loving, a one man open an act. Living the dream, dreaming about you and me, and that's a fact. I'm your forever loving, baby, one man open an act. I whisper your sweet name when I walk out on the stage. I see your eyes in the light, your face through the haze. You know the songs I write, you know I wrote for you. I'm coming home soon, baby. I'm coming home to you. Damn, I hate the leaving, but I love the coming back. I'm your forever loving, a one-man opening act. Living the dream, dreaming about you and me, and that's a fact. I'm your forever loving baby, one man open an act. Last stop, Kalamazoo. I'm hauling ass home, coming to sing to you. Here I come, baby. Damn, I hate the leaving, but I love the coming back. I'm your forever loving, a one man open an act. Living the dream, dreaming about you and me, and that's a fact. I'm your forever loving, baby, one man open an act. Your forever loving, baby, one man open an act. Woo! Just me and you, baby. I'm Sherry Duvall. I'm the founder of Canines for Warriors, which is located in Ponte Vedra Beach, Florida. We're a national charity that provides service dogs to disabled veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, and military sexual trauma. We are the only service dog agency in the United States that provides uh, these life-saving dogs uh, for no charge. 
and we are also the largest in the United States. So today, after just about 10 years, we have placed uh, close to 700 service dogs with disabled veterans. They are able to go home with a fully trained service dog to help mitigate their disabilities from the wounds of the invisible wounds of war. And we have um, had a 98% success rate with our program. So I feel that we're doing um, the lion's share of helping with veteran suicide, which um, is kind of the untold story that we're losing over 20 to 22 veterans a day to post-traumatic stress uh, disability from um, combat battle and the wars that we've seen since 9-11. My own son, um, who is not in the military, but he was a contract laborer under the Department of Army. He was a dog trainer, professional dog trainer. And they, at the time of the invasion of Iraq, they needed desperately um, bomb dogs to go over and hunt out the IEDs. So my son did two tours in Iraq. And when he came home, I did not even recognize who he was. He was just, um, I mean, his body looked the same, but um, he was gone. He was an empty shell inside. And I knew right then that I, I had lost him. And um, I felt strongly that he was about maybe three, six months away from suicide. Um, he was a veteran police officer, a canine handler. I didn't think there was anything that he hadn't seen but I was wrong. We see our veterans coming home from lengthy wars. In fact, in Afghanistan, it's still going on 19, 20 years. And our kids are coming home severely damaged um, internally, uh, mentally. And these are fine, productive, strong people that can't deal with the aftermath of war and what they've seen, what they've done. Um, even though it was in their service and they were exemplary at it, um, they felt that um, life could never be the same for them again. And they resort to drugs or alcohol, and ultimately they take their own lives. Um, and I can't tell you the mothers that I've talked to that, have, that, that didn't know how to help their sons. I didn't know how to help my son. But because I was blessed that he was a um, canine trainer, and Every, the only time he was comfortable around anything was a dog. And I thought, oh boy, um, here's, a, here's a, a light bulb. And so we, um, we did some uh, research on service dogs for post-traumatic stress. And there was very little out there about it. And I, I just felt strongly that if a dog could bring out um, the light in my son, that he could do that for others. So we came up with this idea of training service dogs for um, this invisible wound. We could see um, like the opening of a flower, these veterans coming out of their shells, they were talking again, they were socializing again, um, they were happy again. And that didn't mean that they forgot all the wounds of war, but they were able to adjust to it so much better and just with the help of a service dog. Um, the worst thing that the veterans do when they come home is they isolate. And isolation, of course, is the worst thing for them. So when they got their dogs and we forced them to go to uh, grocery stores, restaurants, uh, chain stores, um, buses, airplanes, travel, whatever situation, that they're uncomfortable in, that's exactly where we take them. And they realize they can do it with the aid of their battle buddy. And in the military, they always say to their battle buddies, I've got your six. And these service dogs have their six. And they can navigate life and get back into civilian population with dignity and independence. Memorial Day to me is a multifaceted day. Um, of course, we want to remember our U.S. military um, for generations. Um, I have family members that were lost generations ago, 
And so we want to take that time to remember their sacrifice and their service. But fast forward to today, we can let no veteran behind. We just can't. It's our duty. It's our obligation. It's the right thing to do, to take care of those that have taken care of us, that have paid the ultimate sacrifice. I've held gold star mothers in my arms that their lives will never be the same because their sons were killed or the, the young men and women that come back and take their own lives. And we, we have to stop this veteran suicide. We, we owe it to the nation's number one asset, the United States military. So on this day, on Memorial Day, Praise the past, learn from it, and take it into the future to today's veterans and today's military and help them. If it's your neighbor or your family member, reach out, be patient, um, find out how you can help, tell them you love them, and show them that life is worth living. But let's take this day and make a pledge that will we remember all veterans that have lost their lives for us and are living today. I want America to roll to remember, not just Memorial Day, but every day. Thank you for participating in the Rolling to Remember virtual experience. And now it's on to the ride tomorrow at noon. We're asking each of you to ride your own 22 miles in your community safely in line with whatever your local guidelines are, but you can still be counted. It's not too late to join to sign up. Use the Rever app, R-E-V-E-R. -E -E it's a free app. Join the um, Rolling to Remember Challenge and ride your 22 miles so you can be counted. And we appreciate uh, your advocacy and it's going to make a difference. And if you're able to also, please consider donating so that we can continue our programs at rollingtoremember.com. When Americans sign up to defend our country, they know what they signed up for. When those men and women become missing in action, our Congress also knows what it signed up for. And that obligation continues for their families when they're missing, either in body during wartime or whether in mind in the fight against suicide. We will continue to hold Congress to its promise and its obligation as we roll to remember the men and women who are missing in action. While you're on RollingToRemember.com, please sign up for our petition to add your name to the roles of Americans who will demand that we never forget those who served our country. They served our country. Now it's your opportunity to serve them. Again, thanks for participating with us today. If you're at all able, please sign up to take the challenge and ride with us tomorrow. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam God bless America my home sweet home God From the mouth.